Well, good morning, church family. <laughs> Thank you for coming this morning. We do appreciate that. As uh, Brother Mark said, uh, our pastor is preaching down at uh, Indian River Baptist Church, I believe it is. Uh, he's doing a revival there, and our prayers go out to him uh, and that church as well. Well, pastor has blessed me with the pleasure of uh, filling in for him here at Cornerstone. And my prayer this morning is that the Lord would allow me to, uh, through his word, be able to deliver a message that would be both pleasing to you and uh, to him as well. Amen. So before we begin, Pastor also asked me to go over some things, uh, bring everyone up to speed uh, on our ministry. And I know there's some new faces out there, praise the Lord for that, that may not know my wife and I, and we are Paul and Sherry Halk. My wife Sherry, would you stand just for a second? I know you hate it. <laughs> Okay, she's not going to stand. She is very obedient. <laughs> but we are uh, your missionaries to the incarcerated and to the addicted. We started Miss Bob Ministries back in 2003, and for the last 16 years, we have led over 8,000 men, women, and children to the saving knowledge of our Lord and Savior. May He receive all the glory. We started a substance abuse class that is active in several county jails and prisons throughout five states. It's named Free Indeed, and we called, that at, called it that after John 8.36, which reads, If the Son therefore shall make you free, ye shall be free indeed. Amen. To date, there's been over 850 graduates from the class. A few years back, I wrote a book uh, entitled When Pigs Fly, which Todd Coran... There you go, Todd. Todd Coran pushed me to write. It's an ongoing joke we have. Uh, so uh, the book is basically my testimony of how the Lord took me from a life of degradation and sin and delivered me into a life of joy and peace. Hallelujah. So mark this on your calendar and consider this your invitation. On March 30th, it's a Saturday night, at 6.30, right here in this church, we're having our Miss Bob Ministry Celebratory Banquet. We're celebrating, as I said, over 8,000 souls won to Christ. There's going to be godly music, uh, video, testimonies, and powerful preaching. Not by me. <laughs> Not to mention food. Did I mention food? Uh, you know, we, we are our Baptist, and uh, that means we can't fellowship without lots and lots of food. You know the old saying, when Baptists meet, chickens die. <laughs> so, but seriously, seriously, please come and celebrate us. We'd love to have you. There'll be sign-up sheets. There are sign-up sheets. If you, as you go out this door, down the hall there, on the left-hand side, there's sign-up sheets. Please sign your name on there. We, we have to have a count. I don't want to run out of food. We are Baptists, like I just said. I don't want my death to be because I didn't have, ran out of food. So lastly, the Restoration Center of Florida. We call it TRC. That's a mouthful. The Restoration Center of Florida. You already lost your attention. It takes so long to say it. So TRC is going to be a beacon of hope in this community. We will provide food, shelter, both educational as well as vocational assistance to women being released from prison or jail. After signing a nine-month contract with us, they will attend classes and chapel on campus and attend services here at Cornerstone while training or actually working at a job. They will be monitored closely and counseled weekly to assure their success. And our prayer and goal is to make their transition back into society as seamless as possible. We're currently under construction, still, and are looking for an opening date sometime this summer, good Lord willing. Thank you for indulging me and uh, trying to catch everybody up. So now that that's all done, let's go ahead and get started. You know, your pastor has been preaching over the last few weeks or months, I'm not sure, uh, on Ezra and Nehemiah and how through faith, the building of the wall, in spite of in spite of all the opposition that surrounded them, was still being built. You know, I, I text Pastor last week after his sermon. I told him, you know, Pastor, I love your sermon, but 
It's getting a little political, don't you think? I mean, week after week, we hear about the walls being built, the walls being built. It's a little contemporary, <laughs> isn't it, in spite of all the opposition? <laughs> but it struck me that this same application is, is in every aspect of our Christian life. First, there's vision. You've got to have a vision. The Bible says without vision, the people perish. Then there's a prayer. You've got to pray about this vision that you have. But I think that the key to all of this is faith. Faith is the key. The Bible tells us that without faith, it's impossible to please Him. This got me thinking hard on faith. And uh, I don't know about you, but I'm the kind of person who needs uh, an example that for something to register in this hard head that the Lord has blessed me with. So as I look for an example of faith in the Bible... I had to look no further than Abraham. So if you would this morning, please turn with me to Romans chapter 4. Romans chapter 4. And uh, this is the Apostle Paul, and throughout this chapter, he's telling us about Abraham and his faith. What kind of faith he had, what his faith within. And if you remember, Abraham, it was imputed to him for righteousness because of his faith. It was a valuable lesson for us to learn here this morning. So we're going to start in verse 18, chapter 4. And the Bible says, if, you, if those of you that can't stand, if you would stand with me to the reading of, of God's Word. Verse 18, the Bible says, Whom against hope believed in hope, that he might become the father of many nations, according to that which was spoken, so shall thy seed be. And being not weak in faith, he considered not his own body now dead when he was about a hundred years old, neither yet the deadness of Sarah's womb. He staggered not at the promise of God through unbelief, but was strong in faith, giving glory to God, and being fully persuaded that what he had promised, he was able also to perform. And therefore, it was imputed to him for righteousness. Now, it was not written for his sake alone that it was imputed to him, but for us also, to whom it shall be imputed if we believe on him that raised up Jesus our Lord from the dead, who was deliv delivered for our trespass, our offenses, and was raised again for his justifications. Let's pray. Father, we're gathered here this morning seeking a word, seeking something that we can apply to our lives in your word this morning. Now we realize that in order for that to happen, that we need to prepare ourselves to receive this message. So it's our heart's desire that we can at least, if not just for the time spent in your word this morning, that we can clear our minds of all the clutter that this world has and focus on what you have for us today. I need your help, Father. Please allow me to deliver this message in a manner that would be pleasing to you. Set my shortcomings aside, of which I have many, and give me grace as we move through this text. For it is the name above all names that we pray. Amen. You may be seated. You know, I, I read this portion of scripture here in Romans, and, and I'm amazed at this man's love for God, Abraham, and his faith in the Lord. It's no wonder that Paul uses Abraham as a ex uh, supreme example to prove that salvation does not come simply by any other method than faith. It does not come by keeping the law or good works. Paul's point here and throughout the chapter is that salvation is produced purely by faith. And here he recalls one of the greatest miracles of the Bible the birth of Isaac. Oh, you may ask, well, what makes this birth so special? Well, for one, Isaac's father was a hundred years old when he was born. And his mother was 90. Ladies, can you even grasp in your mind giving birth at 90? <laughs> the Guinness Book of World Record tells us that the oldest mother on record is one Ruth Alice Kilster. She gave birth to a daughter at the age of 57. Now, there's a report of a woman named Ellen Ellis who was said to be 72 in 1776 when her child was born. 
But however, compared to Sarah, these women were teenagers. <laughs> so Paul has been referring to the faith of Abraham to prove his point that men are saved by faith. And now he's going to tell us what kind of faith Abraham had. It was faith in the promise of the birth of Isaac. And it was simply faith in what God said. It came down to his faith in God that brought salvation to Abraham. And there's a lesson that we can learn from this story. So I want to spend a little time this morning talking about what I've entitled False Teeth, Pampers, and the Word of God. <laughs> hey, you'll see. In verses 18 through 20, which we read, Abraham's faith was well placed, it tells us. The direction of his faith. Uh, verse 20 tells us clearly that Abraham staggered not at the promise of God. This simply means that Abraham didn't waver. He believed without reservation in God's ability to keep his word. So what was the promise anyway? Well, to really get a grasp of the promise, we have to go back to uh, Genesis 12, Genesis chapter 13, Genesis chapter 15, chapter 17, 21. That's way too much. We don't have time or the patience for that. So I'm going to hit on a few of those just to get you up to speed. In Genesis chapter 12 is when the promise was given to Abraham. Now he was 75 years old at this point. And he says, Now the Lord had said unto Abraham, Get thee out of thy country, and from thy kindred, and from thy father's house, unto a land that I will show thee, and I will make of thee a great nation, and I will bless thee, and make thy name great, and thou shalt be a blessing, and I will bless them that bless thee, and curse him that curseth thee. And in thee shall all families of the earth be blessed. This is the promise, that through Abraham and Sarah, they're going to have a child, and all these generations are going to come from it. Now we jump to Genesis 13. This is the story, if you remember, that what we're going to focus on is uh, Abram and, and Lot. Hey, brother, how you doing? <laughs> Abram and Lot, and uh, they're, they're traveling together, and they're, they've gotten to a point where they have so many servants, so many sheep, so, so much cattle that they're trespassing on each other, and they're fighting, they're Shepherds and stuff are fighting over the land. They just, there's not enough land to contain them all. So Abram stands up and says, Lot, this is our problem. We need to move on. You take a choice. You, whatever direction you go, I'll go the other with the families and the flocks. Now we all know Lot chose wrong. He chose out toward Sodom and Gomorrah. And eventually, a few chapters later, we find them in Sodom and Gomorrah. Abraham, on the other hand, stayed true to his faith, stayed true to the Lord, and went the right direction. What direction did he go? Verse 18 of chapter 13 of Genesis tells us, Then Abraham removed his tent, came and dwelt in the plain of Mamre, which is in Hebron, and built there an altar unto the Lord. So his faith was constant. We go to Genesis 15, and, a and Abraham is struggling now because years have gone by and he still does not have an heir. So this is Abraham speaking. He says, Lord God, what will thou give me, seeing I go childless? And the steward of my house is Eleazar of Damascus. In other words, he says, look, I have this servant. He's been true. He's been faithful. I don't have an heir. So how about if I just give, it to, to, uh, give everything to uh, Eleazar? But the Lord said, this shall not be thine heir. But he that shall come forth out of thy own bowels shall be thine heir. And he brought him forth abroad and said, Now look at the heavens. Look at all the stars. I'm paraphrasing a little here, obviously. Look at all the stars. Can you count them? Obviously, you can't count all the stars, just like the, sea, the sand of the sea. And so he says, I'm going to give you more generations are coming out, more people are coming out of your loins than all that you can count. And... It's just amazing to me. You know, he, he, he uh, is following the Lord so, in, in spite of every doubt, in spite of everything that's going on, he continues to follow the Lord. Now we get to Genesis 17. Now Abraham is 99 years old. This is 24 years after the promise. And God said to Abraham, As for Sarah thy wife, thou shalt not call her name Sarai, but Sarah shall be her name, and I will bless her and give thee a son also of her. Yea, I will bless her, and she will be a mother of nations. Kings of people shall be of her. How did Abraham react to this? 
Next verse. Then Abraham fell upon his face and laughed and said in his heart, Shall a child be born unto him that is a hundred years old? And shall Sarah that is ninety years old bear? I mean, come on, that's pretty impossible to believe. And then he says, if you remember, Sarah had a handmaid in Hagar. And Sarah has lost some faith in this as well. So she turns to Abraham and says, listen, I have this handmaiden, Hagar. Why don't you take her unto you? And we'll have a child with her and we'll raise him. Sounded great to Abraham. I mean, you know. But uh, it didn't wash with the Lord. So, in, and so here in, verse, in, chapter, in Genesis 21, and the Lord visited Sarah and had said, as the Lord did unto Sarah as he had spoken, for Sarah conceived and bare Abraham a son in his old age at a set time of which God had spoken to him. And Abraham called the name of his son that was born unto him, whom Sarah had uh, bare to him, Isaac. And Abraham circumcised him after eight days old, as God commanded. And Abraham was a hundred years old when his son Isaac was born unto him. And Sarah said, God has made me to laugh so that all that hear will laugh with me. And she said, who would have said unto Abraham that Sarah should have given children suck? For I have borne him a son in his old age, and the child grew and was weaned, and Abraham made a great feast unto the Lord again that day. This is amazing to me. When you take all these verses together, they teach that God supernaturally caused Abraham and Sarah to have a son named Isaac. And Abraham directed his faith toward God, even when it seemed that what he had promised was impossible. The duration of his faith is what we see in verse 18. Verse 18 says, Who against hope believed in hope that he might become the father of many nations, according to that which was spoken, so shall thy seed be. This was 25 years from the promise until the birth of Isaac. When the promise was first given, it had to seem impossible at 75. Even then, I mean, that was, that was a lot to hold, even at 75. But when the promise was confirmed in chapter 17, he was 99 years old. And yet, as impossible it seemed, it happened. His faith did not waver. The Bible tells us that Abraham believed God. And let me encourage someone here today who's been waiting for the Lord to move in their lives for a long time. He hasn't forgotten about you. He hasn't. If he has made you a promise, you can count. You can count on it being fulfilled in his time. In his time. That's the problem. You know, Lord, please do this for me. Man, it's been 15 minutes. I haven't seen nothing. You know, <laughs> you know it's his time frame, not ours. But we just need to hang in there and trust in the Lord. In verse 18, we also see the determination of his faith. He refused to listen to reason. Notice, he hoped against hope. Most of us would have doubted. I know I would have. I, would, I definitely would have doubted. I would have said something like, you know, hey, I'm just too old. And Sarah and I, we're all shriveled up like prunes. We can't do nothing, you know. Hey, don't laugh at being shriveled up by prunes. You know, I noticed it was the younger folks who, who said that. You know. I'm, I'm knocking on the door at 70. I had a heart attack. I've lost over 40, 45 pounds. I know what looking like a prune is. Matter of fact, the other day, I don't remember where we were going. I was in the bedroom getting dressed. I had the closet door open, looking through things to see what I was going to wear. And my wife walked by and she says, honey, if you're going to wear that shirt, I'm going to have to iron it. I didn't have a shirt on. <laughs> So I know what it means. <laughs> but you can imagine, they're saying, you know, we've tried to have a baby since we were young and nothing has happened. Why is it going to work now? I mean, it's physically impossible. This is things I would have said. Apparently, Abraham refused to dwell in the negative. Uh, what a lesson that is for us. We get knocked around. We get put down. But you know, the Lord is still the Lord. Verse 19 tells us he refuses to look at reality. Abraham refused to look at his situation. His eyes were always on God. Can you imagine this old couple as they're prepared? 25 years 
for the birth of their son. I, I see the scenario kind of like this. You know, the promise was made, Abraham's 75. At 76, a year later, nothing's going on, so he goes out and starts building a crib, you know, making a crib for the child. A couple years go by, he's 78, no sign of anything. So, you know, he's, they start making a list of names. What are they going to call the baby? Now he's 80 years old. Nothing. No action, no go, nothing going on. They get on the camel, go into town, go to the supermarket, and order a big box of super absorbent pampers. <laughs> 85 years old. Nothing. I'd be discouraged. He goes hunting. Sarah has a baby shower. At 86, they start putting wallpaper up in a corner of the tent where the nursery's going. <laughs> now we go forward and he's 90 years old. Nothing going on. 90! They subscribe to a new parent magazine. 93, still nothing happening. So they start some Lamaze classes, you know. At 96, 96 years old. He starts doing camel runs to the hospital. He wants to make sure everything is right. At 98, packs a suitcase and leaves it by the tent flap. At 99 years old. Come on, you got to be doubting a little bit by then. That's 24 years from the promise. Nothing going on. I can just see him scratching his head saying, hmm, I wonder if God's joking with me, you know. Did he doubt? Sure he doubted, he was human. Human. Look back at Genesis 17. He says, Abraham fell on his face and left and said in his heart, Shall a child be born unto him that's a hundred and Sarah ninety? I mean, sure he doubted. But he didn't let that doubt overcome him. Right. He just kept on keeping on. He, he, yes, he doubted. Surely he himself had at some point feel like the promise was more like a joke being played on a couple of old people to make them look foolish, you know. Listen, faith is not 100% certainty. Faith is belief mixed with unbelief. But the action is taken on the belief. When we let doubts win, that's not faith. When we trust God's word in spite of all the odds, in spite of our doubts, and we act on that, that's faith. And Abraham acted on faith. I don't know what you need from the Lord today, but if you have had his promise in any matter, I challenge you to act on faith. Learn what faith is. Hebrews 11.1 1 tells us, Now faith is the substance of things hoped for and the evidence of things not seen. I love that. <laughs> I mean, that's, that's Abraham. We also need to learn that nothing else pleases the Lord but faith. Hebrews 11.6 says, But without faith, it's impossible to please him. For he that cometh to God must believe that he is and that he is a rewarder of them that diligently seek him. We also need to learn that anything else but faith is sin. Romans, uh, I lost my place. For Romans 14.23 says, For whatsoever is not of faith is sin. These are pretty plain, simple things that jump out at you from the Bible. Then we simply need to just take God at his word and hold on. Now we learn that Abraham's faith was well placed. And now I want you to see that Abraham's faith was well pleased. He was pleased with God's promise. His faith was pleased with the promises of God because he knew that they were from God. And as faithful as the God who made them. What I see here is a man who didn't look for reasons to doubt God. He simply took the Lord at his word and he praised God for the answer. Even though it was not yet visible, that's faith that pleases God. And he was also pleased with God's plan. He knew what God had promised to do. He knew what God was able to do. That's why Abraham could take his teenage son Isaac to Mount Moriah willingly to offer him as a burnt offering before the Lord. He knew that even if he did, God was able to raise him up again. Abraham's faith was well with the Lord. Because the Lord took the faith of this old man and credited his account in heaven with righteousness. To put it another way, God saved the soul of Abraham because he took God at his word. So, we've learned that Abraham's faith was well placed and well pleased. And lastly, I want you to see that Abraham's faith was well preserved. 
his faith was preserved as a promise. And not just a promise to him, but to us all. Look at verses 23 and 24. Verse 23 says, Now it was not written for his sake alone that it was imputed to him, but for us also, all of us, to whom it shall be imputed if we believe on him that raised up Jesus our Lord from the dead. What I see is a man who did not look for reasons to doubt God. We learned that the promise was made not only to put righteousness in his life, in Abraham's, but also to everyone who exercises faith. Not just any faith, but saving grace in the Lord, of Jesus, in the Lord Jesus Christ. Now there's a lesson here about salvation. Abraham believed in the promise of, of God. And for us to be saved, we must believe in God's promises fulfilled in Jesus Christ. Acts 4.12 tells us, Neither is there salvation in any other. For there is, no, for there is, none, under name, there is none other name in heaven given among men whereby we must be saved. In Acts 16.31 it tells us, And they said, Believe on the Lord Jesus Christ, and thou shalt be saved, and thy house. John 14.6, you all know this. Jesus said unto him, I am the way, the truth, the life. No man cometh unto the Father but by me. Your faith is in something this morning. I'm telling you that your faith is in something. Is it in Jesus and is it in him alone? Lastly, verse 25 tells us that it was also preserved as a person. Look at verse 25 with me. Who was delivered for our offenses and was raised again for our justification. The promise boils down to one man. Jesus Christ. He's the eternal focus of every promise that has ever been given to us from God. He's the one through whom all the nations of the world will be blessed. He's the one who died on the cross and rose from the dead. He's the one who paid our sin debt and rose from the dead to be our Savior. He is the focus of the faith. And if He's not the focus of our faith, then our faith is dead. Amen. Plain and simple. Our faith stands on two great pillars of truth. And they are one, Jesus died for our sins. Amen. And two, he rose from the dead. Amen. Romans 10, 9, 10, 9 through 10, that if thou shalt confess with thy mouth the Lord Jesus and shalt believe in thine heart that God has raised him from the dead, thou shalt be saved. For with the heart man believeth unto righteousness and with the mouth confession is made unto salvation. 1 Corinthians 5, 3, 4. For I delivered unto you first all that which I have received, how that Christ died for our sins according to the Scriptures, and that he was buried, and that he rose again the third day according to the Scriptures. So, if you can believe this, if you can believe these two truths, these two pillars, and can place the totality of your faith in these truths, then you can be saved. Otherwise, there's nothing for you but hell. Now, I don't mean to be rude. I'm not trying to be crass with you or anything. I'm just telling you what the Bible says. So in closing, let me say this. With all the honesty that your heart can possess, can you truly say that you're trusting in the Lord Jesus Christ alone for your soul's salvation? Paul's conclusion to this section of Scripture makes it clear that nothing else or no one else will work. Salvation must come through saving faith in Jesus Christ. Abraham believed, and he was saved. It wasn't works. It wasn't the law. It wasn't attending church. It wasn't giving the missions. It wasn't any of that. It was faith then, and it's still faith today. So therefore, this morning I ask you, what's your faith in? What is your faith placed in?